Well, good morning, everybody. I think I'm going to take this as the cue to officially say the Zoom door is not exactly closed, but it's sufficiently open for us to start. I'm David Yoakum, the director of the Policy Lab at Brown University. If that's a new entity to you, I would encourage you to go visit thepolicylab.brown.edu and learn more about how we're working really every day to generate and use evidence to improve how we govern ourselves in Rhode Island and how we organize our communities together. And in that vein, I'm very excited for today's conversation around how we can help small and minority owned businesses recover from COVID-19. It's of course difficult to be a small business in even the best of normal times, but this is a moment where there are lots of unique challenges, regulatory requirements, health issues, complex issues about how to navigate this well, and a lot of evidence that small and minority owned businesses are being uniquely impacted in this moment. And so I'm thrilled that we have three fabulous individuals to help us think and discuss this issue. I'll give a short introduction of each of the three of them. I'll say right at the onset that the way we're going to structure this hour together is a little bit of facilitated conversation between the four of us, but then we're going to, of course, reserve a fair chunk of time for audience questions and discussion. And you're welcome throughout the discussion that we're having at the onset to drop questions in the chat box. We'll use those in the Q&A section. And who knows, maybe we'll also slip some in sooner than that if you get a particularly good and timely question while we're talking about it. So to jump right into it, let me first start by introducing Lisa Wrangling, the founder, president, and CEO of the Rhode Island Black Business Association. She's got 10 plus years in leadership positions and experience in helping businesses and community uh, develop with a particular lens on diversity and inclusion. Rhode Island Magazine also named her one of Rhode Island's most powerful and influential women, and maybe I'll leave it at that. You can go peruse her bio for more details further. Second on deck, we've got Oscar Mieas, the president and CEO of the Rhode Island Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Again, a rich background and experience helping people who want to better their lives, but don't know quite how to start, is how he's framed it to me before, and especially within the Latino community. He's got a rich background himself of starting up and running entities, which you can see the success of in things like in 2015, being awarded the Minority Owned Business of the Year. And then thirdly, we have Matt Sheath, the Director of Stakeholder Engagement and the Chief Marketing Officer at the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation. He's held a wide variety of communication positions in both the federal and state government, as well as national nonprofit organizations and campaigns. So like I said, a wonderful trio of individuals bringing a lot of experience and perspective on our topic today around how we can help small and minority owned businesses recover from COVID-19. So to get started, I'd actually like to ask each of you to respond to an open-ended question or sort of invite your, your insights and perhaps even one concrete example, if you happen to have it, about the realities of being a small business during COVID-19. And in no particular order, Oscar, maybe I'll, I'll check it over to you first to get your thoughts on that. Thank you, David. Um, it's an honor for me to be in this uh, panel with great panelists, Lisa, Matt, and of course with you and your team. So thank you very much for inviting me to, to this presentation. Um, I would like to, to start saying that uh, this pandemic, this crisis have put a highlight in some of the issues that the minority business have been for a long time. And it's like uh, we are discovering what is the reality with the business, a small business in this day. So has been a very complicated uh, time, has been like a, too much confusion uh, through the social media, through the information, which is not verified before launch to outside, has been a very complicated time. Um, starting from I don't deserve or I don't qualify for a loan, and finishing in those theories and conspiration inter interplanet, a comparison from other worlds. So it has been a very complicated uh, time for the confusion in terms of what is happening, what will happen, and what would be the future of the small business. So um, organization like, like the, the Hispanic Chamber and other organization has been working so hard to try to put some order and to uh, help our business owners to understand better what are the options and what is necessary to, to uh, face the new challenge, that the challenge that, that are present right now in front of us, um, how to survive, how to adapt to the changes and all that stuff. So 
I could say properly that we have been really, really busy trying to help our business to survive and navigate this, this crisis. And I'm gonna have a lot of follow-up questions about what you've laid on the table there, but let me continue the around the room. Maybe go to you, Lisa, next for sort of a, an opening insight, maybe a concrete example about the realities of being a small business right now. Yeah, so David, thank you so much again, um, you and your team for the opportunity to be here with, again, my partner in crime, I would call them Matt and Oscar. Um, again, this journey, as you talk about supporting uh, minority and, and small businesses, as you can tell, um, historically, small businesses are the, the engine of our economy. We know that small businesses historically create more new jobs across the nation. We also know that when small businesses are thriving, um, they impact job creation, they impact the economy, and they impact um, several other things, again, as it relates to lifting communities up from poverty to sustainability, as well as leveling the playing field for all of us. What I can tell you when this pandemic started back in, I think we, we, we caught wind of it, again, for me from the association, probably more so late February and into March. And I think, you know, as you can imagine, when I, I represent, you know, the black um, and the minority business community here in the state, and as you can imagine, we're talking about small companies that are pretty much um, cash flow, right, issue to begin with. They lack a lot of robust investment. They lack um, sustainability or, you know, a lot of things that the larger companies may have. So as you can imagine, when this pandemic showed up, unwelcome, of course, but showed up anyway, it's, you know, drastically impacted not just companies, but also um, families and um, communities, right? We know that when minority companies are doing well, they hire people directly from their communities. So what we know that it wasn't just an impact on the businesses and the direct impact to the economy, but also to real people, to families. And I think we have to be very careful when we, 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 we talk about small businesses or minority businesses. And I can just share with you that minority business wants to just be known as businesses, right? They create jobs too. They're a part of this um, equation and it's not necessary. When I think of the word minority, it's, it's, it's less than so. I typically refer to business owners that are owned by people of color rather than utilizing the word minority. Again, we wanna be just seen and known as businesses. Um, again, so the biggest issue that we have seen from an organization perspective, as Oscar noted, is around access to um, capital, access to contracts opportunities, access to cash flow and bonding and so forth. So, and these are issues that has been um, around historically for years, but as you can imagine, the pandemic actually made that even worse for this population. So again, lots of challenges. I think the biggest thing that we also saw was about the lack of bankability for these companies, right? So that has been a really severe um, impact on these companies. Keep in mind the, you know, the black and brown communities, we don't have wealth in these communities, so we can't rely on either a home equity to, to take cash out of that or to go to a mom or a dad or a relative of some sort. So having the lack of access to capital has really um, severely impacted these communities, especially the business community. And I think right now we are working diligently to ensure that our businesses actually survive. What we've heard and seen is uh, you know, across the nation, um, we saw some prediction, we hope it's not true, that around 50% of small businesses, especially micro businesses, may not survive COVID-19. And if you can imagine that, think of the devastated impact to real people and jobs and the overall economy. So we have to work jointly, um, collectively to ensure that, again, we save all of our businesses, right? Um, because we want to ensure that we continue to have a robust economy. And Matt, an opening insight, perhaps example about these times for small businesses? Sure, uh, and I echo uh, my friends and partners' comments. David, thank you to you and the team for having me here today. Um, on top of the, the issues that Lisa brought up with access to capital, as someone who spends my day thinking about how do we get information out to businesses, this crisis really shone a light on um, 
what avenues and are we using and how are we reaching all businesses out there not, who maybe don't want, listen to the, the TV or the radio, who maybe uh, don't have steady access to internet. And so um, the crisis really asked me to think about what ways can we partner with organizations to really get out in the community. So when you think of um, maybe some of the requirements that we put on businesses to shut down, maybe it's retails. And we said, you can't open your retail store, but you can switch to selling uh, things online or switching to a curbside pickup. Some of our micro businesses we found out maybe don't even have a website yet. So how do we use this pandemic and this crisis to really find the needs of our community uh, and wrap around services to them to help them not only get through these immediate next couple of months, but set them on a path for success to have the tools and the resources and the capital they need to thrive. Thanks, Matt. And thanks to all of y'all for giving a sort of opening shot across the bow on some of the issues we might talk about in this hour together. Matt, I might stay with you for just half a moment here to, to maybe give a little bit of 101, particularly for those who perhaps aren't small business owners themselves, which we have many in the audience. Could you give a sense, just a little bit of the texture of the small business environment in Rhode Island? Like what is a small business, a sense of how many of them are across the state, and then we'll, we'll pivot from there to think about how they're being influenced more in this moment. Sure, so uh, small businesses in Rhode Island make up uh, more than 90% of our economy. Um, the small business, admin, the Federal Small Business uh, Administration defines a small business as a business with uh, less than 500 employees. We know here in Rhode Island, uh, that the average small business is much smaller than that, maybe 20 or fewer employees. Um, and we have a cross, big cross section of, of micro businesses. Uh, and as I said, they are the backbone of our economy. They're everything uh, that supports our tourism and economy to retail, to restaurants and hospitality. Um, and so they, you know, they are what uh, many of our, our employees are made up of. Uh, and so that's why it's so crucial to have the supports to, to sustain them. And a micro business is just a smaller business still, I presume? Five employees or fewer. Five or fewer. And to stay with you just for one more moment, you alluded to a variety of the regulations that are being asked of small businesses in the moment. Could you say a bit more about what are being asked of small businesses in this moment? Sure. So uh, we know that when the, the pandemic hit, uh, there was a lot of information to get out quickly. And so we created a website, reopeningri.com as the one-stop shop where businesses could find the most up-to-date requirements, the regulations, not only for requiring them if they had to shut down, but how they could reopen in a safe and productive manner. And one of, and as overseeing the website, one of the main goals I had was to make sure that we at least had uh, the information up in Spanish as soon as the English was posted as well as then branching off to various languages that are represented across Rhode Island. And so, um, but directly to your question, one of the first things that we did is, and the governor talks about it, is we physically shut down our economy to get a grasp on this virus. So we shut down restaurants, we shut down retail, we shut down social gatherings, we asked churches to limit their numbers drastically or go to online. Um, and that's tough. And uh, it's tough for a number of reasons because it's scary. Businesses don't know um, when they'll be able to reopen. Maybe some of them are surviving week to week with, with cash flow issues. So it's a scary time. And so we wanted to create a one stop shop, easy to find information on reopeningri.com to not only tell them about what they need to do to shut down, but how they can reopen and feel confident when it was the appropriate time to reopen safely. Lisa. I am curious your perspective on some of these changes that Matt was just alluding to. And I tend to think of sort of a, a phase one of whenever the real lockdown and shutdown happened, sort of your description or your sense of what happened to small businesses in that moment. And then maybe I'll come up with a follow-up of <laughs> now that we're starting to reopen how that's going. Yeah, I, I think it was, you know, um, as Matt alluded to the fact earlier around sort of the lack of access to opportunities in terms of information, I think that was a big challenge. Keep in mind, when we focus on the minority or the, um, the micro population, the micro businesses, again, what we're talking about, again, it could be you know five or less, nine or less, under 10. But when you think about that population, most of them are actually out in the field working 
So they're not readily uh, sitting at a computer reading everything that may be published via the television news or some website. Some of them, as Matt knew, you know, alluded, they don't even have an infrastructure from a website perspective. So as you can imagine, um, we scramble to get information out to people. We actually have people out in the field working to find people to make sure they are aware of, again, the requirements, what had been put out by the governor and her team around you know, making sure that one, we keep Rhode Islanders safe, but also that we follow the regulation and the, and the guideline that's um, outlined as it relates to the pandemic and how do we really flatten the curve and keep everybody safe, right? So our approach was very different. It wasn't like sending a blast email, right? That work, again, we looked at different method, right? In order to engage our members and, and our clients, again, we know what the needs are, we know them, and we know that sometimes you have to just show up at the work site. Sometimes you show up at their house, right? Sometimes you have a text. I mean, Matt knows this. I had been texting like crazy to connect with people. Um, these are businesses that have my cell and the cells of our staff and that kind of thing. So it had been very, very difficult to get the information out and get the right information out. And then once we became, we're moving from that sort of just getting information out and allowing people to sort of operate to a, you know, a small, the first phase or the second phase, I think that was also um, another problematic matter in trying to get out the supply that they need, whether it's access to the PPP loans or to supply mask and clean and supply, that kind of thing. So um, I think you know, it requires us to think innovatively and work creatively to really reach the really hardest hit community. As we know, Latinos and Black, the population where the hardest hit. So as you can imagine, the standard shoot out an email or a blast PSA did not reach many of our clients, right? So we had to work with churches, community leaders, and other partners to really engage those communities. How would you describe the sort of the hardest hit in a little more detail? Are we mostly talking about businesses going under altogether? Are there additional sort of nuances to that to unpack, particularly for the, I mean, I bet it's second nature for you to think about what that means, but for maybe those who are new to it, can you give some particular examples? Yeah, so let's, let's look at your, your small companies with four or less, for example, you're talking about a barbershop or hair salon, a small restaurant, a diner, right? So when you think about, um, you may hear, oh, six feet social distancing, right? So think about of a barbershop. We have lots of barbershop and hair salon in our communities. So think about most of these places are very small. They cannot even, they don't have the space to do six feet <laughs> to be operational. What, are they gonna only have one person? Are they gonna only have the stylist, the barber, or what have you? So as you, that was very, very challenging. And I mean, people were, I mean, shocked by the requirement, but knew that they had to comply with the requirement. But also um, the realization that, again, it wasn't just like for a few weeks. Most of them call and said, we thought this was going to be very short. And come to find out, it went into months, right? Um, very recently, I went to my hair salon to get a haircut um, last week. And again, I was the only person in there with the stylist. Again, you have to be by appointment only. There's only one person in the past. It was a packed salon with... 10 to 15 people on top of each other in the past, right? When I went last week, I was the only person in the shop with the stylist, which was amazing. I got great service. I didn't have to wait for anything. But think about the impact, the revenue impact of this when we're doing the streamline approach, limited the number of clients that can be in an establishment due to the capacity requirements and all of that. So I can tell you, the barbershop, the hair salon, the small restaurants has been impacted the most. And any you know, um, establishment that deals with the public, especially within the small and micro business communities, those areas have been impacted the worst. And you alluded to in your opening how it impacts not only on the immediate business, but the larger community surrounding it. Could you say more about that? Absolutely. So again, as I noted earlier, Small business, not just micro businesses, create more jobs than anywhere else, right? Any, any other um, large companies. We also know that these companies actually hire directly 
within their communities. So if they're hiring directly within their communities, if they're closed, right, for a period of time, the workers are also impacted by that closure. But what is really, really um, was very devastating for some of our businesses, I'll go back to the barbershops and the salons, some of these companies, they pay with cash. So if there's not this cash coming in, they have no um, monies in the bank, right? They don't have a cash flow for six weeks four weeks or what have you. So think of that impact to those um, families, right? The workers, their families, but also to their bills and creditors. We had lots of people that contacted us for help with their creditors, right? People were getting eviction, um, evicted, right? Some of the people that work for these small companies, but also not just the ev um, eviction issue, but also the creditors were calling. So if you have a creditor that's, you know, calling and, 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 and constantly calling you and you're closed and you have no money to pay your bills and you gotta, you're in the survival mode, you can imagine the emotional state that this pandemic has caused, not just for the business owner, but for the entire community. So, Oscar, what I mean, for sure, I think it's, you know, the wraparound service right now as we think of survival is very critical, one, to get these business operational, but also as Matt alluded to the thrive, but also to think about it from a sustainability perspective. What does that long-term looks like, right? We know that we're expecting the second wave this fall. So what does that look like as it relates to that long-term and then that sustainability for the business owners, as well as the community, and as well as the overall impact to the state's economy? I think we have to be also mindful of that direct impact, not just on one sector, but again, connect the dots and look at it holistically. And Oscar, same question, your assessment about how the regulations and lockdown today have been impacting small businesses. Well, you know, um, Lisa has explained very, very well. Um, I, I would like to emphasize two things. The first one is the the definition of micro businesses. It is a new uh, terminology for a lot of people that putting the just in one bucket small businesses. But there are a few difference between the definition for the small business administration until 500 employees and $500,000 per year compared with a, a small business with three employees and less than 100,000 uh, in revenue per year. So there are differences in terms of characteristic and in terms of needs. So additional to that, we found uh, communities that are more impacted by the coronavirus. It's a public information that the Latino population has been horrible, the impact that it has. Um, affecting more than 45% of the cases were in the Latino community. And of course, we cannot separate a business owner or a business from the community. All of them have families, daughters, and you know, are active part of the community. So when they face an unexpected shutdown, suddenly they were never have been prepared. So suddenly they need to shut down and be closed for two or three months. The, even in, in, in terms of mental health, thinking about what I'm going to do. Should I close and definitely close my doors or I will try to survive? But that surviving time could be very dangerous because I could be spending all, all my uh, savings. So at the end, what would be the future? What I'm going to do? Additional to that, uh, the difficulties to get access. The difficulties of the, those small business who um, doesn't have a documentation ready uh, uh, in terms of taxes or all that stuff, and they didn't qualify for funding. That is an additional stress, an additional pressure for them. We find um, business that, that just opened in October, November, or December, very close to the beginning of this crisis. So they weren't ready. They just invest a lot of money to start the business and suddenly they were shut down. If, if we see all those elements and in the moment, all those who can survive 
need to do an investment to follow the regulation and to be compliant with the regulation for the opening process. If we put all that together, it's a really, really hard uh, situation for small businesses. So definitely uh, the, the work to help them need to be more specific in, in terms of access to capital, but in terms of technical assistance. So that, that is a job that needs to be done one by one because all of them are different. And in terms of the industry that has been more impacted, restaurant has been the number one and personal services. Lisa I mentioned barbershop, uh, hair salons, uh, personal services, massage and others has been really, really uh, um, hard with the situation because the proximity, the closing with the customer require more security implementation. And the government has been very um, helpful providing uh, PPEs and organization, the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, business, Black Business Association and other groups has been collaborating and distributing the mask and the uh, uh, hand sanitizer and all the stuff. However, our small business need more than that. So our labor, our, our job is not, doesn't finish when we find that the business uh, qualify for a PP loan and they receive the money. Our work keep and need to be in a continuous way from now and the next, I don't know, six months, going with them because it's not just about capital. It's about how they implement the, the new regulation, how they need to be in compliance with those regulations and how they will change in terms of the new challenges. Incorporating technology to their business that maybe they never have opportunity to do that. Uh, uh, the investment that could imply to incorporate technology, new strategies on marketing and all the stuff is creating a burden time for the business owner. So it's not easy. And we, um, we think that all together need to work in order to help our business. Uh, we are not isolated. The Latino business are not isolated. The Afri African-American business, the black business, or the, even the white business. All we are connected. All we are have business relationship. So it's necessary to work together in order to survive this crisis. David, if I could just add one thing about the regulations and the reopening process. Um, we were lucky here in Rhode Island, there are some sectors of our economy that never shut down construction and manufacturing throughout the pandemic, they stayed open. And we were lucky that uh, in our New England region, we were able to open a lot of our sectors like personal services and restaurants faster than our neighbors. And we were able to do that because of a partnership we had, not only with Lisa and Oscar and other business groups, but, but hearing directly from business owners in these businesses on what was doable uh, if we did have reopening regulations, what would be doable, what would they need help from the state to achieve that? So it was really drafting these reopening guidelines together. And one thing that I'm hoping that comes out of, a good thing that comes out of this pandemic is the new and revitalized relationship between state government and the Commerce Office with businesses across the state um, in this new partnership of working together to creating what works for them. I'm hoping that will continue for months and years ahead uh, to come. Yeah, and that's an excellent point. And David, if I can just chime in, I think one you know, Oscar brought up some really great points around sort of, you know, companies have to diversify right now, right? So again, what we've seen, you know, some of the products and services that they've, you know, historically offered, again, they have to think about different, um, different ways of, of delivering their products and services, but also to think about areas where they probably had not gone into before as it relates to diversification of their products and services. So what we have seen um, with several of our clients, again, is having these conversation about, you know, this is not working based on the constraint where I had been because of the pandemic. Is there an, uh, an area that there is a growth span within that era for us to look about? Can we look at either expand into that arena because there's a demand out there that needs to be satisfied. The other thing that we have been doing with businesses as we think about sustainability and long-term, it's really for them to think about business continuity. And what does business continuity looks like? 
we're talking about if there is a pandemic. So right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. How do we survive? And what does survival mean to each of these businesses that we're talking about, the small or the micro businesses, right? Most of these companies did not have a, a business continuity plan. I've called and I've you know, said, guys, if this happens, then how are you going? If you're doing everything in a small office, and now that you need to do all this operation remotely, do you have the infrastructure to do that? And the answer was absolutely not. Because again, most of them were planning and all of the things that they have been doing from an operation perspective had been in a small office or their establishment, right? So now as we're working with clients, we have to have the conversation around how do you think about the virtual um, way of doing business and for you to grow your, your business um, products and services, not just here in Rhode Island, but looking at it from a global perspective to make sure that you're taking advantage and seizing the opportunity of this um, pandemic. Because what it has also showed us is that I saw a study recently that says night, uh, productivity is up 90% for people that are actually working at home right now or remote, right? So that tells us that we're seeing better performance from people that are in, you know, at, at their home, juggling their children or what have you. So that tells us we have to also have the mindset how do we tap into the market globally versus some of our businesses we're just looking at it more from the point of view of here in Rhode Island on the local level. So I think this has certainly opened up opportunities for more people. What we have also seen is this huge support for especially Black businesses um, within this um, climate that we have right now with the Black Lives Movement. So um, a lot of things have changed and I think people are working intentionally and going out of their way to really do businesses with small and micro companies because they really want to impact you know, changes, but they also want to support the economy and they want to support businesses grow and thrive and create jobs and to really um, build wealth. It's really around lifting communities up, right? We want to see more home ownership within black and brown communities. We want to see the reduction of health disparity we want to see the increase in jobs, high paying jobs and so forth. So having strong businesses, micro businesses, it's a win for all of us. And I think we need to think of ways, how do we work creatively to really ensure that this population of businesses that we have here that we're talking about, that they're not only just um, surviving, but rather that they're thriving and they're building wealth and they are going to grow their revenue stream, but also grow their product sets. And, and some of the solutions to what Lisa's talking about, it's not, it's not rocket science, you know, it's getting tech support and we were able to get free tech support for businesses who didn't have a website at the start of the pandemic, just to build something as simple of a, as a website to get on the e-commerce platform to be able to sell their goods and services outside of Rhode Island. So um, I love work partnering with Lisa and always like hearing, hearing how she explains things and the solutions there, uh, you have to be intentional. It's not rock and science, but we have to be intentional in our actions to solve them. Hey, Matt, we actually have an audience question that's asking directly what agencies or resources are available to help micro businesses set up e-commerce. Sure. So uh, we have a small business hotline. It's uh, 521 Help. Uh, and one of the first initiatives that we launched at Commerce at the start of the pandemic was a, a free tech uh, hotline and we were able to get some of the largest IT companies in Rhode Island to donate their time uh, pro bono and so businesses could go and schedule uh, basically uh, think of it like a genius bar appointment when you go to the Apple store you could set up an appointment with them to lay the foundation to get the expertise whether it was to um, we had some of them wanting to set up email for their for their business for the first time to move from their own dedicated email to a website um, to do uh, enable remote work for their employees. So uh, we have that free tech hotline. We were able to also get um, free laptops from Microsoft that we were able to do an application for. Um, these are our what some of us might think are our basic items for a business, but a lot of our micro businesses didn't have that basic infrastructure. Um, so we were able to help help provide that. Um, David, I, I would like to complement something about the, what Matt said. 
is regarding that all of our, our organization, and there are other organizations, minority organizations outside that are working with the constituent members, non-members. In, in the case of the Hispanic Chamber, we open the membership for free, so we can uh, attend everybody who needs support. Uh, we have been working with Commercial Right, and we, are, uh, we want to act like the first door. If someone doesn't feel comfortable to, to go to a website because even they don't know how to reach the website and all the stuff, organization like ours, like the Hispanic Chamber, the Black Association, Urban Venture, uh, there are several organizations, the Multicultural Business Center, that could help you, could help the business owner to at, at the first step. If they don't feel comfortable, we have our doors totally open and we are working um, with Commerce Array and other organizations who could provide uh, support, technical assistance, even guidance and orientation on how to use those resources that are available in the state. So we invite, I invite um, business owners to don't hesitate to communicate with us. Contact us and ask the question that they want to ask and we will help to redirect them or even work with them in order to reach those resources that right now are really, really important. Yeah, that's a really great point, Oscar. And, and David, if I may, if I may add, I think one of the things that is, is we're you know thinking about how do we go forward and how do we ensure that we're impactful um, and with the work that we're doing, I think we want to be also be mindful that we're not fragmented, right? And that we're working strategically. And we're looking at where does it make sense for us to invest and where we're going to see the greatest um, return in investment. Because what I would um, not want us to do is to throw good money at just a problem for just like a Band-Aid fix. Um, I think it's very important as we're thinking about what we're trying to do from the um, ensuring businesses are surviving is that we're thinking more from a long-term perspective and that we're putting in solution that's actually going to work from a long-term perspective rather than just a little what I consider Band-Aid fix. And Band-Aid fix in my mind are short-term fixes. That sort of, you have a really big cut, but you put a little Band-Aid on it and you know that is not going to heal, right? So we gotta be more thoughtful and we gotta be more intentional. And we have to make sure that we're designing programs um, that are actually working for the people that need it the most. And, and again, we gotta engage these constituents to hear from them. I always, I, I, always, I think it's very important for just, not just to design something that we believe is good for them, but rather to have them part of that solution um, process to design a program that they know will work because they are the closest to the problem. They're dealing with it right now. And I think if we're able to do that, um, work really in the mindset of engaging the people that are impacted the most, I think we'll you know, really deliver a great product that really works and have lasting impact. Very, very long lasting impact, I should say. And Lisa, do you have an example in mind that would help us get a little concrete about what's a Band-Aid fix versus a more long-term structural oh, fix? Oh, absolutely. Um, so I can, I can share an example. So for instance, um, I'm going to put it out there. So 2015, and this is, again, Mayor Elorza um, awarded $200,000 for Rhode Island Black Business Association as it relates to economic um, development and really to impact small businesses. And over, um, as you can think of the population that we're talking about, the need is extremely great. So we got $200,000 in 2015, but year after year, the funding actually went down significantly. In some years, we got $0 allocated in the budget out of the, the mayor's CDBG fund. Um, and when you think about sustainability and a long-term fix, you can't give a, an investment upfront and don't sustain that over time. Because as you know, when you're doing planning, again, I'm a planner by trade, when you're doing planning, planning goes, again, you have your three to five years before you really start seeing significant improvement when you're thinking about um, long-term sustaining um, wins, right? So if you give this money upfront and there is nothing that had that carry through, and that's why the, the implementation, the adoption, the sustaining is very critical as we think about how do we drive meaningful changes that really breaks down barriers and create environments that work for businesses so they can thrive and they can really be 
growing. And what we want to do is to make sure companies are growing inc incrementally, right? So if you have a company that was making $100,000, once we start working with them, the goal is for them to get to two, three, five, right? So you have that metrics that you're saying, we're doing this, these, these things, and this is the output. You create 100 jobs, you create 50 jobs, you create 20 jobs. So there has to be quantifiable things that are actually being, being done and things that you can actually measure. I think transparency, um, and accountability and all of this ties together, but we got to make sure that we're not doing these um, Band-Aid solution. We've got to think about it strategically. Again, 400 years of slavery and, and 400 plus year, we're seeing what we're seeing the devastated impact of slavery right now. And I think we have a moment right now for us to seize and to make sure whatever we're doing um, is to do things that is really going to drive changes across the board. I shared this with the governor on Monday. We cannot leverage the same people that has been a part of the problem for years. We got to put new people, a part of that team, to really help with the creative juice, if you will. So people can start thinking about how do they work intentionally because the same old, if you do the same thing over and over, year over, you're gonna get the same result, right? And I always say, let's go in there and flip it upside its head, right? and take it apart, dissect it, look at what's actually working well, let's keep it, what's not working, get rid of it, and what is working somewhat but needs to be enhanced, let's do it. We've got to be intentionally what we're doing around assessing the current state to determine where we're going from a future state perspective. David, on the, on the, PPP, on the PPP side, the program created uh, to provide these uh, forgivable loans uh, for businesses um, when it was first rolled out, um, you know, the, the money went very quick and we saw that, you know, companies like Shake Shack and all these conglomerates uh, were able to access the program first um, because you, you needed to have a banking relationship to process your application. I think Lisa and Oscar would agree with me, like that is a structural problem in creating that program. And so when the second wave came out, um, we partnered with Lisa and Oscar um, to help us get out in the community, to get out to businesses who are unbanked, who don't get their news from the traditional news sources, to put feet on the street, as Lisa said, texting businesses, going door to door, and Commerce found a financial institution that would process applications of unbanked businesses so that they could get in the door to get these forgivable loans. But as Lisa says, you have to be intentional. You can't create a program that would require a banking relationship and expect to get applications processed from all these businesses when they don't have a banking relationship. That is a, a, a structural, that's a problem in the structural creation of that federal program. Yeah. The question, oh, go ahead, Oscar. Uh, no, no, just to, to say that um, organization like, like um, our organization are working to, to build a bridge between those resources, those, pro, those programs and initiatives can reach our constituent, our small business. Um, however, joining with uh, what Lisa said, this organization needs to build capacity. We need to grow, we need to be ready to react in a specific situation like this. Um, we, are, we know that it won't be the last time or oh, after the coronavirus, we will be happy and everything will be happy forever. We need to understand that we are in a critical point of time where we need to redesign ourselves, not just personally, but as an organization and even as a business owner, we need to redesign. Thinking in recovery, in go back and see and be again like we were at the beginning of the year, it won't happen never won't happen again. We need to redesign ourselves, redesign our business, think again or rethink again about how could we um, act in the future. And the organizations like us who work with the community need to be ready, need to be to build capacity and have that capacity of reaction in front of the needs of our business. So um, it's important that again, government agencies, organi minority organizations, or community organizations need to be tied 
to just one goal, help our business to survive. It, the small business and the micro business in our community are the backbone of the economy. It's a, it's a um, maximum uh, expression that is real. In our uh, community and our minority communities is what sustain the economy of those small communities. And um, when we try to think, how could we help each other? One thing is buying local. Of course, it's really easy for people who is ready to go online, buying Amazon, buying uh, in other uh, big, big stores around the country. But we cannot forget that those are small businesses in, in our community, in our neighborhood, they are struggling too. Um, maybe it's not the same price, but when we buy in our uh, small businesses, we are helping not that business owner to be a millionaire. We are helping that business owner to contribute with the community and to support other business in our community. So that is really, really important to have in mind. And it's part of our mission to re-educate, re-educate our community to think in that way. Buy local, support our business, because it's the best way to help each other. Is there a list of local businesses that we could point the audience to? And actually one of the audience questions was a subset of that, of whether there's any list of businesses that are owned or operated by people of color. So yeah. I was just going to share, uh, Oscar, and you can chime in after. I would like to share that there is a new site that's actually launched um, very recently um, for the Black business community, and it's called um, blacklivesbiz.com. That's the actual website. It was um, developed by a young man, Arnold Mill, at the Nelson Center here at Brown University. Um, again, that is www.blacklivesbiz.com. That's a site that we're actually working diligently to try to get all of the Black businesses across the state to be registered with that website. And that's actually a national platform. So again, it rolled out recently in, in Providence, um, but again, it's, it's national. You can still filter by states. But one of the things that we're doing from Reba perspective, the Rhode Island Black Business Association, is to ensure that we help with the identification of all black owned businesses in the state and to make sure that they're actually registered with this, this hub. So it's really searchable and people can find it. We wanna encourage um, people to shop local, but more importantly, shop micro businesses because that's where we need the greatest help right now. Shop local, absolutely, but shop small and micro right now. Go out of your way to find them, regardless if they're like out in Pawtucket or Central Fall or what have you. May go out of your way, be intentional, do something different out of your comfort zone. Drive 20 minutes because you want to support a micro or a local business. Is I think it's the right thing to do. Yes, in, in the Hispanic Chamber, we are working in several projects at the same time uh, in order to collect more information and to provide more support for our business. We have our own database, which again is open to uh, jo not just for members of the Chamber, but for everybody. Um, we are creating a marketplace in our website where uh, the people can identify business where to buy, where to do the shopping, um, that they are locally. In, in other side, we are trying to, to visit and work with the municipalities in Providence, in Central Fall, in Woonsocket, in Potocket, work with them in order to provide technical assistance tailored to the needs of every uh, uh, city. So we have been working with the mayors in uh, the main cities in the state and collecting information and provide a specific service in, in each area. So. If someone wants to uh, know the listing of business that need help or that they could collaborate and contribute with buying local, uh, we have that information. So the people could reach us to website or through the uh, phone number uh, that I will share at the end. Uh, we, are, we are more than willing to provide that information. And David, it's not just about Matt Sheaf or David or, or us as individuals buying local. 
it's important for our big institutions, our big corporations that are based here in Rhode Island to also do more of buying local. And so, you know, Commerce has an initiative that I'm, I'm really proud of called Supply RI, where we're working with our large anchor institutions and asking them to commit to buying more of their goods and services locally from Rhode Island small businesses. And in return, we're also helping our Rhode Island small businesses get uh, the skills they need to, to uh, apply for those procurement opportunities, to know about them, to enhance their pitches, so that we can keep more of our spend here right in our local economy. Because as Lisa says, that's what supports the families of these business owners and helps all of us grow. And Matt, I'll stay with you for a moment for an audience question, noting that a lot of businesses are currently not accepting uh, cash for sanitary reasons, but not everyone actually has access to debit or credit cards. How do you think businesses and community members should move forward through this issue? So uh, it's a really good question. And I, I believe the General Assembly uh, actually passed uh, legislation. It could be last session, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, re requiring um, cash payments because um, not accepting cash could be a, a form of, of discrimination. And so uh, we are encouraging contactless payments, um, but it is an, an it is important to be able to accept uh, currency. I will say that the tech hotline uh, does have resources to help businesses get set up for cashless contact systems. And there are some financial resources from commerce available to pivot and add those services on to the business as well. So uh, for those looking for information, I'd encourage them to call our, our small business hotline. David, I, I don't wanna miss the opportunity to, because um, we all talked about access to capital is a, is a big need. Um, last week, the governor announced that there is going to be uh, $100 million available for small business relief, uh, with the first tranche of money being $50 million available to small businesses in the forms of grants, because we know grants are so important, up to $15,000 for small businesses, with a commitment by the governor to take 20% of that $50 million and hold it specifically aside for minority-owned enterprises. Um, the, the application for those grant funds and more information will be available on the Commerce RI website, but I did want to give a plug uh, to get the message out there that grant funding will be available for small business relief. And David, um, in, in, in that sense, to support the, um, the new form of payments, electronic payment and e-commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is starting today a series of webinar talking about, in general, about how to incorporate technology in our business, what that means, what implies to go into the technology and bring the technology into our business. So this afternoon at 6 p.m., we will have a, a virtual networking and our panelists will be talking about that. What applications are outside that we can use? Uh, what is the real implication to incorporate um, technology in our business? And how to deal with that? with electronic payment, with electronic commerce, with setting our website or the social media to sell our products because it's a new marketing way for, for some business owner, for a lot of, of business owners. So um, additional to that, there are another consideration that we need to have as a business owner when we talk about technology, which is cybersecurity. Because now we are working with more technology, we are, we are more exposed to cyber uh, attack and to cyber thief. So this is, those are important elements. And in the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we are starting today. Uh, I invite everybody to register for this afternoon at 6 p.m. We will be talking about transition our small business to the, for a lot of people, new digital era. And we're almost out of time, but still so much more to talk about. But maybe the way I'll round this out is to invite each of you with maybe just one minute to take the floor for any final reflections, anything else you want to plug. And Lisa, maybe I'll, I'll come to you. You've got the first minute. Oh, sure. So thanks, David. Thanks so, God, so much for the opportunity. It was just a, a pleasure to be here to share you know, the work that we're doing. I will certainly plug the organization. Folks can, you know, we have lots of volunteer opportunities lots of ways that people can get involved supporting us financially or with their skills, talents, or capabilities. They can check us out on our website, which is www.ri-bba.org. 
They can also contact us via a phone number 401-383-1179, or we're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and YouTube, I was told, as well. So again, we're connected um, electronically, digitally, and yes, I think moving to that digital footprint is very, very important. It's going to take some time for our business to get there, but we're definitely on board to support them. Matt? A minute for you. Thank you, David, and, and thank you to the Policy Lab for uh, having me on this on this great panel. Um, I really hope that uh, there will be some lightness that comes out of this, uh, the dark times and the pandemic. And I hope this will uh, help us to increase our partnerships, uh, to increase our connections with the community and the business associations who are out there working to support um, businesses. Uh, I encourage folks, if they have any questions or need assistance, to go to commerceri.com or call our small business helpline, uh, 521 help. Um, there are, as I said, there are grant opportunities with the applications coming out next week. And uh, I think I'll, I'll leave with this thought. Uh, as Lisa and Oscar and I talk about often, we need to be intentional as we create new programs and support services for our small business community. We need to be intentional and be agile. So if the program isn't created perfectly the first time, I know agile is not usually a term you think of for government, but we need to be agile to it to make sure that we can tweak them so that the most number of businesses are able to take uh, advantage of our opportunities. Thank you. And Oscar, a minute. Thank you, David. Thank you, the Brown team, for inviting us to be present in this panel. I think that has been very, very interesting. Um, I just want to reinforce my message. We are in a critical time. It's time to redesign, to reinvent ourselves, to rethink our business and our community. And in that sense, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce will keep working so hard and, and per bringing personal services to our constituents and working with other organizations, with Commerce Array, with Black Business Association and other organizations. If anyone needs help, we are here to help people. So our phone number is 401-400-1340, 401-400-1340, and our website, www.rihispanicchamber.org. We are here to help our business community, and thank you very much for having us. And I will plug one more time the policylab.round.edu, which I encourage you to visit. Sign up for the listserv if you're interested in working with project, projects with us and also for great events like this, I hope to see all of you more again. Oscar, Lisa, Matt, thank you again for the wonderful conversation and I look forward to seeing y'all in another venue. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.